Good afternoon, everyone. It's quite an honor to be here and uh, first time in Geneva. What a beautiful city. So um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of uh, what I've been doing uh, in the past uh, almost 20 years of my uh, AI career. And it's mostly focusing on computer vision and machine learning. Great. So um, the visual system is one of the oldest and most important uh, sensory system for animals. In fact, uh, more than half of our brain is involved in visual processing. It's been uh, 540 million years of evolution. And to today, vision is one of the most important component of human intelligence, responsible for many activities that are important for us, such as navigation, um, the manipulation, communication, um, entertainment, work, and, and, and so food seeking and, and all this. So animals from simple ones all the way to um, complex ones almost ubiqui ubiquitously have a visual system. In fact, uh, a fun fact in evolution that uh, vision was said to be responsible for one of the most important evolutionary events in, 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 in the history of animal kingdom, which is the Cambria explosion 540 million years ago, uh, during which time that the number of animals quickly exploded from just a few handful of uh, different species all the way to um, many, many more. So. Um, it really uh, underscores the importance of visual intelligence as part of the overall uh, intelligence system. In the same time, in the same time, the evolution of uh, visual machines has a much shorter period of time. Uh, just like AI as a field is about 60 years old, Computer vision as an important area of AI is about 60 years old or a little, a little less. So even though we've been uh, progressing rapidly, the technology of vision is still just at the very brink of uh, making important contributions to our society. Uh, we still have not yet given sight to most of our visually impaired um, fellow, um, fellow people. We, we have lots and lots of cameras from the space all the way through the airplanes and drones overseeing our, our home, the Earth, yet we don't have a comprehensive technology to map out everything we're seeing. Or um, in swimming pool um, scenario that today we still don't have a very robust system that can uh, uh, detect uh, drowning uh, swimmers, or in healthcare, there is increasing demand in terms of uh, visual uh, um, visual processing for diagnosis. So many areas of uh, human life and society today demand uh, computer vision technology, and uh, the goal, I think as a computer vision scientist, is really to develop algorithms that can shine, light, uh, shine light in, uh, onto this digital world. So with that in mind, today I'm gonna share with you um, two research talk, oh, actually. Um, in terms of uh, the, the progress of computer vision, we have come a long way. Just as Thomas has introduced earlier, ImageNet has become a benchmark for the progress of computer vision and, and uh, contributed to the uh, progress of machine learning and deep learning. And if you just look at the image classification task uh, from um, the first year that ImageNet challenge was rolled out, which is 2010, all the way to um, about two years ago, the error rate has been steadily decreasing, especially thanks to the uh, breakthrough technology of deep learning, to the point that it's hard to distinguish the performance of a human versus uh, the performance of machines. In fact, in the field of uh, computer vision, um, we have many areas 
We have many areas of research, not only in object classification, but also object segmentation, object detection, human pose estimation, 3D object recognition, scene parsing, and so on. So this is a very lively and thriving field uh, working on the basic technology of visual intelligence. Well, today with this audience, I would like to share with you actually two um, application area uh, that we're applying computer vision technology to. One is in AI-assisted healthcare, another one is for uh, visual senses. And then to conclude, I'll also discuss a topic that is uh, very dear to my heart, which is about education and diversity. So let me start with the first topic, which is uh, what we call the guardian angel uh, system, AI-assisted healthcare. One of the most, uh, here is the guardian angel hypothesis. AI technology can help better the workflow of healthcare. We hear a lot about diagnosis using AI technology, especially radiology, pathology, and so on. But there is another huge area of of healthcare that's really important, which is workflow. Workflow happens everywhere from emergency room to operation room, from ICUs to primary care to, uh, to uh, pharma uh, pharmacy or home care. So workflow is an area where patient, um, we care about the quality of treatment, the, the, the safety of patients, as well as um, innovating technology to cut down the cost. Here, as an example, we worked on one really important uh, problem. Is someone else driving my slides? <laughs> if, if yes, can you let me drive my slides? All right, thank you. So, uh, so this particular problem is a hospital-acquired infection. It's actually a really prevalent problem in all healthcare systems. In America, one in 25 patients um, um, uh, get infected by hospital-acquired infection, which might have actually fatal consequences to patients, costing um, America uh, about 35 to 45 billion dollars per year. And one of the most important factors for hospital-acquired infection is hand hygiene. That's a leading driver. So the lack of good hand hygiene practice by medical personnel from nurses to doctors uh, is one of the biggest drivers for this issue. So it's a really hard problem to solve. And in the past, uh, <laughs> in the past, uh, what happens is for, for decades and decades, we use uh, the hospital system use in-person audit. We have secret sharpers that tries to uh, um, assess the quality of this. And recently, RFID technology is used to try to replace uh, human audits, but RFID is very um, coarse and it um, has a lot of uh, signal, low signal to noise ratio problem and uh, uh, disrupts uh, workflow. So, with the recent advancement of uh, computer vision technology, especially, um, especially, okay, especially sensors that provides privacy, which are depth sensors, we have proposed a computer vision uh, system that can track the movement of clinicians in the hospital without intruding in their privacy, so we don't have to reveal who they are, but be able to track their uh, hand hygiene movements. And this is uh, non-invasive, it's continuous, it's unbiased, very, very cheap, and powered by AI algorithm. And this is a collaboration with Stanford's uh, Children's Hospital, where in a particular hospital unit, this is the floor plan you're seeing, that we put these sensors close to the, in the hallway, close to the um, hand hygiene um, 
uh, dispenser, and we can monitor the the the, um, the movements of the clinicians. Uh, long story short, we used a deep uh, human tracking and then deep learning recognition system behind our uh, technology and our performance of this hand hygiene uh, activity uh, recognition. Um, um, the, the, the recognition is actually really high, in uh, better than many of the state of the art systems. And uh, here's an example of um, of. Here's the example of what you see as the system detecting a person and his or her moment of hand hygiene activity. So um, uh, one of the most exciting aspect of this technology is the one of the most exciting aspect of this technology is it's continuous, it's cheap, and uh, it can not only, hand hygiene is just the beginning, but in the hospital and, and, and patient environment, there's many, many activities that requires continuous monitoring from patients themselves as well as clinicians. And this work is opening up possibilities in using AI to assist the workflow environment of our healthcare um, institutions. And uh, these are the students and, and doctors, doctors who collaborated, who collaborated with us in this uh, particular um, work. So now um, I'm moving on to the second work I want to share with you is actually census. Census is what government uses to get an understanding of what our society is. Government spends billions of dollars every decade or so to do a census. United States just did a census in 2010, uh, spending about a billion dollar per year. And this is where we get basic information of demography, income, education, race, and, and, and all this. Um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, my student and I start thinking about a really crazy thought is, can we do census for free using data, big data available around the world or, or in the country in America? And we thought about Google Maps. Google Maps not only have GPS information, it has pictures. It has millions and millions of pictures of our streets on Google Street View. And there's one object that is prevalent in every city, every neighborhood in America. And that object is a car. A car really has a lot of information. Every time you know a car, you can look at its make, model, year, and, and get a lot of information from that. So we thought of this crazy project that we're going to um, go to the 200 most populated city in America, and uh, and download um, Street View pictures from Google uh, Google Map. Um, we downloaded 50 million images from the 200 cities in America, and then we're going to detect every single car on the street and use a computer vision system to recognize all the details, the make, model, year of the car. And we're going to use that to infer the social um, uh, makeup of America's cities. So this is the project we did. We call it Visual Census Demographic Prediction using 50 million Google Street View images and the cars in them. I'm gonna um, skip what exactly we did in terms of car recognition. It suffices to say that we use a deep learning system to, to first detect a car, the presence of a car and put a bounding box on it, and then use another deep learning system to recognize 2,657 uh, 2, types of car ever manufactured by human society in, after 1990. And, uh, and the, uh, the recognition accuracy is really high. And with that, we can get a lot of, uh, um, a lot of information about cars. And then we can ask questions like, can cars predict 
uh, house, uh, neighborhood or, or, or city income. And I'm going to just skip this and say we use a lot of features of the car, but the long story short is um, um, on, on, on your left, the actual uh, zip code and income house co uh, average household income is the data collect collected by household uh, by U.S. Census. On your right hand side is the predicted average household income by using the car information we we get from the Google Street View. High correlation. Here's another example. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip this. Here uh, we even use car to predict voting results in the 2008 presidential election, Obama versus Vic, uh, McCain. And we can go down to zip code precinct level to, uh, is someone else clicking again? <laughs> Is uh, is uh, here's an, a map of the Democrat versus Republican voting results by precinct. On the left is the actual uh, uh, result. On the right is the predicted result with the car uh, car information. So, um, in summary. Uh, here's something fun for you. What car predicts Obama voters? It's uh, sedans. It's uh, high, um, um, highly environmentally friendly cars. And, uh, and if it's an environmentally uh, uh, friendly city, that's an a Obama indicator. Uh, whereas uh, for Republicans, um, apparently they're high, highly correlated with trucks and SUVs. Um, so with this data, we actually, can we go back one slide, please? With this data, we actually can predict cities and their environmental, um, how friendly they are to the environment. We can predict crime rates. We can predict segregation of the cities. We can predict uh, the, the uh, different races. So it's a very, very fun study using massive um, available online uh, imagery data. Um, and here are the students who collaborated uh, with me on this uh, project. Do I still have time? Yeah. Uh, let me try. All right. <laughs> All right. So the last, uh, uh, the last work I want to share with you is a recent uh, um, nonprofit foundation we, we put together called AI for All, focusing on the diversity issue in AI technology. So we're all here because we believe AI will change the world. As an educator, the question that really is very prominent in my own mind is who will change AI? If you look at the, the, the demography of technologists, computer science technologists today, we have a very alarming trend. In, uh, in, in academia or, or in, in America industry in general, that we have decreasing since, uh, trend in terms of uh, uh, the percentage of women uh, taking on computer science uh, uh, related jobs or getting computer science degrees. In Silicon Valley, um, the companies, the major companies who have released their data in terms of uh, gender um, are, are, are showing a very uh, unbalanced uh, um, trend in terms of the number of women working in these uh, high-tech companies versus men. And the, pro um, the picture for underrepresented minority is even more grim. We don't have much data on that, but we know that uh, we have very few African Americans, Hispanics, and so on working in computer science in general, as well as AI. So um, uh, just about uh, half a year ago, a little more than half a year ago, the Obama White House uh, held a uh, science conference, and during which there was a panel we discussed this. Why do we need diversity in AI? Just to put it, uh, uh, very uh, concisely, well, it is first really important for 
for the labor market and economics, AI and computer science jobs are increasing, not decreasing. We need to include more people. It's really important to, to have creativity and uh, innovation in our technology, as studies after studies have shown that when there is a diverse group of people working together, the results are more innovative and creative. And of course, it's important for our social justice as well as the reflection of our mor moral values. So recently, with the help of uh, um, um, my former students and colleagues, we put together a, uh, we launched a nonprofit called AI for All, focusing on educating the next generation of AI technologists, thinkers, and leaders. And the mission for AI for All is to bring diverse voices of AI uh, and so that the next generation of the technologists can reflect the, the, the composition of our general population. And the focus of AI for All is through education programs. Um, we use, um, we, we partner with universities to hold um, K to 12 uh, uh, the programs, mostly summer programs, focusing on AI education and humanistic-centric AI teaching. And we hope to create an ecosystem between students, current technologists in industries, as well as uh, um, the public and uh, policy makers. And uh, the inaugural universities that are um, Participating in these programs include Stanford, Princeton, Berkeley, and Carnegie Mellon. And um, um, some of our founders and advisors come from a diverse background of entrepreneurs, um, uh, Silicon Valley um, uh, CEOs, educators, and policy makers. And we're very thankful that uh, Melinda Gates and uh, uh, Jensen Huang are the, the the, the seed funders of AI for All. So with that, I just want to conclude that whether we're doing education or technology, it's just the beginning. It's a very exciting time for, for AI, very exciting time for computer vision. And uh, I'm happy to talk more offline. Thank you. <laughs>